What do you say to God when you're suffering and in tremendous need? What words do you offer up to God? What is your prayer? Oftentimes when we feel abandoned, when we feel that God is not answering our prayer, that he can't hear us, we pray after prayer after prayer, we change it around, we become more urgent, we say it more often, and yet it appears that God does not hear our prayers. So what do we do when we become frustrated at God, when we feel like we're being ignored from God, that God does not hear our prayer? Today, we're going to hear from King David. King David feels exactly the same way. He's in tremendous need. He's suffering very much. He's pleading to God, and yet God is not responding. Let's find out what David's prayer is. Now, his prayer can be a model prayer for us and give us tremendous encouragement. Stay tuned. We're studying Psalms 22. We're going to have a fantastic lesson. Thank you for joining me on today. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, October 13th, 2024. Thank you for joining me on today. The title of our lesson is A Plea for Deliverance. A Plea for Deliverance. It will come from the 22nd Psalm and we'll read verses 1 through 11. So that's Psalm 22 verses 1 through 11. Before we get started, I want to ask a favor of you. If you can, if this lesson has any value to you, if it blesses you in any kind of way, uh, please hit the like button, hit the share button. And if you're not a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button. This goes a long way in helping this lesson reach many, many people. And those who are newcomers or long, been here for a while, I want to thank you for your continued support. So let's get right into this lesson. Uh, this lesson is written by King David. Uh, King David um, is going through some trouble. As we can tell by this psalm, he's suffering, he's in need, and he is in need of God's help. And the issue is that he has, he's in need, he's praying, but it seems as though God has abandoned him. So David pens this psalm as a model or encouragement for those who are going through the same situation he's going through. They're suffering, they're in time of need, they're hurting, they're in pain, and yet it seems as though God is not responding to them. He's turned a deaf ear, and this psalm will be a psalm of encouragement and will help us have the right words or the right understanding when we pray to God. Now, the issue here. Uh, let me just give you a little, another tidbit here is that it says, according to Doe of the Don, this psalm was written to the tune of to the Doe of the Don. So this psalm is a uh, song, it's a poetry. It was something to be sung generation after generation after generation. And it was written to the melody or to the tune of the Doe of the Don. So we have that there, too. What else do we know about this psalm? We don't know the background. We don't know the history. We can't point to a particular place or an incident that would, uh, well, uh, we can say that David wrote this because of this. So we can't do that. But um, what we do know, I'll give you some, some theories and what some scholars have said, and some I agree with, some I disagree with. But the first one is many people believe that David, who was a king and a prophet, wrote this psalm as something prophetic, 
something to predict the future, or he wrote it in such a way when he was writing it, being led by the Holy Spirit, he was predicting the sufferings of Jesus Christ on the cross. So this is a prophetic uh, psalm, hymn, poem that predicted the type of suffering that Jesus would uh, suffer on the cross. I have a couple of problems with this is because if he this was prophetic uh, and this was written a thousand years before the birth of Jesus, it was written 600 years before crucifixion was even invented. How would the people of that day truly understand this psalm? How would it mean something to them if the sole purpose of it was to be writing to uh, predict the sufferings of Christ that is yet a thousand years away? And so I, I, I struggle with that. So I, I kind of discount that a little bit. Uh, I don't believe that it's prophetic in that sense because I don't see the value that the readers would have. And uh, I don't see how David could write about a crucifixion that he knew nothing about that had not been invented. So I kind of discount that way. Another option is that uh, this lament is crying out in pain, crying out in need and suffering is a Old Testament lament to be taken literally, but it is revealed more deeply uh, by Jesus, meaning that Paul, uh, that, excuse me, that David wrote this psalm, and it's it's a lament. He wrote it for the for his audiences, but we don't get the full meaning until Jesus reveals it during his crucifixion. And that one that one has some merit there. Um, you could say that uh, this is almost like a will be will be a typology is a, an event or something that is written in the Old Testament that will point to something or an event in the New Testament. So even though David is writing about a personal experience, something that he's going through, uh, God is using this also to point to an even greater event or a significant event uh, some thousand years later. That, that's possible there. If that's what you believe, I have no problem with that. Another one, a third one would see is that, um, is that this psalm is uh, a lament of an innocent sufferer. And David is actually going through this. And the Gospels have borrowed from this psalm to help portray Jesus as an innocent, innocent sufferer because Jesus was the innocent sufferer par excellence. He was the one and truly only innocent sufferer. And some of the verbiage or wording in here applies to the same type of suffering that Jesus did, had gone through. And let me uh, just read a couple. Uh, if you were to compare Psalm twenty-two eighteen 18 and Matthew 27, 35, it would talk about it says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, clothing they cast lots. It says that in both spots. And then if you were to compare Psalm 22, 7 with Matthew 27, 39, it would say, all who mock me, uh, all who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. Wagging their heads is common in both of those passage. We'll get the meaning a little bit later. And then in Psalm two more, in Psalm 22, eight, it says he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let who rescued him for he delights in him. That same thing is pretty much said in Matthew 27, 43. And then Psalm 22, one, both. And then Matthew 27, 46, both start off or both have in their verses, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus saying at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., right before he dies, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So there are similarities, uh, poignant similarities between Psalm 22 and the uh, Gospels, particularly in Matthew. And uh, many people have said that Psalm 22 more than even the Gospels helps portray the agony or what would, what happened while Jesus was being crucified. But I believe that um, 
this is a uh, David is actually experiencing this. And I believe that the gospel writers borrowed from this since this was a song or a hymn that was passed down from generation to generation. They would be very familiar with this. They borrowed from this to help portray Jesus as an innocent sufferer par excellence, the ultimate innocent sufferer. That's what I believe. So let's get into this lesson here. Let's start with uh, verse one. It says, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And my question would be was, why would somebody say that? Why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I started to think, why would I say something like that? I would say that because not only am I going through something terrible, something I don't understand, something I can't get myself out of, something I did not cause, something I feel like I'm innocent of, I would say, my God, my God, because I would, uh, if God had not answered my prayer, if I'm praying over and over again, 24 seven day and night, and if God has not answered my prayer, if I don't feel like I'm hearing from God in any kind of way, if things have not improved in any kind of way, I would raise the question, God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you ignored me? So that my God, my God would be, why God, why God? Have you forsaken me? That's how I see it. And uh, and another thing I want to say is that a lot of people, we think that uh, my God, my God is in Psalm 22, 1, then it's in uh, Matthew again. But people throughout, believers throughout the time of history, has all, they have always cried out, my God, my God. David is not the first person who has gone through suffering, been in need, and have not heard from God. And Jesus was not the last person who's been suffering, who's been in need of help, or, or asked the same question, God, why have you uh, forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? This, this is something that I have prayed, I am sure that you have prayed, and if you haven't, if you live long enough, you will have this same prayer here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me alone? Why have you abandoned me? Why don't I hear from you? He says, then he says also, why are you so far from saying to me? Why are you, why are you distant from me? Why? We had a close relationship. God, we've gone through some things, and yet at this critical time in my life, you seem so far from me. From the words of my groaning, you seem like you don't hear my groaning and my, my, my cries out. You don't hear the pain that I'm in. You don't hear the discomfort that I am in. So this, 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 this sufferer, okay, innocent sufferer, didn't bring this on himself. Maybe it's enemies that are causing this for him. David is a king. He has an empire. He has plenty of enemies, close and far. And he's wondering, God, why, why, why you don't hear my groaning? Why do you appear to be so far from me? And then verse two says, oh, my God. David's being personal. It's a personal God. He has a personal relationship with God. He says, I cry by day. I cry over and over all day long. But you do not answer. Have you been in that situation? Crying out to God, and yet he doesn't answer. Wondering, God, what do you want from me? What do you expect me to do? What are you trying to teach me? I'm open ears. I, I'm wanting to do whatever, but I'm crying out. I'm in need. I'm, maybe I'm hungry. Maybe I'm, I'm having financial trouble. Maybe my health is bad. Maybe a loved one is at the point of death. Maybe I'm in agony some kind of way, but yet I cry out, but you do not answer me. That could be a frustrating time in our lives thinking that God does not answer me. The good news is that just because God does not answer us doesn't mean he does not hear us. But none, nonetheless, David is wondering, why you don't answer me? He says, end by night. So David is crying out 24-7, all during the day, all during the night, pleading for God's help, 
pleading for his deliverance, pleading for God to rescue him, him out of that situation, wondering what's going on with God. We we just talked last week, but now it seems that you're not talking to me at all. You just uh, uh, did this for me, but now you're not doing anything for me. What is going on? He's crying out to God. He's not giving up on God. He's not uh, quitting on God. He's just just venting to God and letting God know how he feels. And sometimes we need to do the same thing. We're going through something and God doesn't seem to answer. We need to say, well, God, I'm, I'm just venting. I want you to know how I feel. I still, I love you. I, I, I worship you. You're still the almighty God, but God, I'm just wondering how come I haven't heard from you. Okay. It says, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. I cry over and over again, day after day, week after week, month after month, 24 hours a day, and yet I find no rest. I find no relief from the situation that I'm in. He's in a tough spot. And many of us have been in a tough spot. We maybe deal with a, a lingering illness. Um, some people, I was talking to some people about uh, this person's in a hospital. He's been in there 40 some days. And he, he's ready to come home. And he, he wants to come home, but he can't come home just yet. He can't be released from the hospital. And, and in his mind, I'm not getting any relief. God, how much longer do I have to stay in the hospital? How much, when will I get better enough to, to go home? Lord, are you really hearing my prayers? He's not getting any relief. And that's what David is saying here. God, you're not relieving me from this situation. I just want to go home. Verse three says, yet, that means in spite of this, Lord, in spite of you not hearing my prayer, or it seems that, or you're not answering my prayer, you are holy. You are the holy one. You are the perfect one. You are the almighty one. You are the maker of heaven and earth. You are the one that holds the whole world in its hand. You control everything. Nothing doesn't happen unless you give permission for it to happen. He's acknowledging God for who he is. He says, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Enthroned, meaning you are a king sitting on the throne in your kingdom. You reign high. He is paying tribute to who God is. And when we're going through that, we're going through something, God's not answering. It's not a time to curse God or, or quit on God. It's a time to praise God. Uh, you remind, David is not only praising God, but he's reminding himself who God is, and that helps him get through whatever situation he is a little bit better. How much better can we get through our, our trials and tribulations, our sufferings, our times of need, when we recognize the type of God that we serve? It gives us just a little bit more strength or a lot more strength just to hang on and trust him even more. You are holy, enthroned, king, sitting on the throne on the praises of Israel, meaning that the people of Israel worship you. It's acknowledging God for who he is. You are king on your throne, and the people of, God, of Israel worship you. They praise your holy name. You are king on the throne. You are holy. What, what more could we describe God that way? Okay. And then he, said, he says that to say this. In, your, in you, our fathers trusted. You are the holy one. You sit on the throne. You're a king. The people of Israel worship you. In you, our fathers trusted. Meaning that, if I, David says, if I go back, Generation after generation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all our forefathers, our ancestors, they put their trust in you. They trusted you. And, that, and so he says this, they trusted and you delivered them. What, they, what David is trying to say is, God, what you did for them, I believe the same thing they do. But what you did for them, I want you to do for me. They trusted you. They put their faith in you. They were loyal to you and you delivered them. God, I trusted you. 
I put my faith in you. And God, I want you to deliver me out of my situation just like you did my ancestors. My fathers, my mothers, the patriarchs. That's what he's saying. To you, they cried and they were rescued. God, I'm crying just like they are. And you rescued them when they cried out. God, when I'm crying out, I want you to rescue me too. I want you to save me. To you, they cried and were rescued. He's identifying with the struggles of his forefathers and he saw how God delivered them and rescued them because they trusted in him. And he's saying, God, I'm doing the same thing. Give me what you gave them. Deliver me. Rescue me. He said, in you they trusted and they were not put to shame. What does that mean? In, in verse four and five, trusted used three times. In you they trusted. In you they put their faith in. In you, they were loyal to, they were committed to, and they were not put to shame. What does that mean? Put to shame. The enemies are looking and seeing how real your God is. And when they see you in need, they're waiting to see if your God is for real. That's what people do today. When a Christian gets sick or ill or something bad happens, they're looking to see how real your faith is. They're looking to see how your God will get you out of that situation. And if God doesn't bring you out of that situation or if you don't respond accordingly to your trust and faith in God, they will mock you and talk about you. And what it is, in, in a sense, they'll put your God to shame. And so what David is saying here, in you, they trusted and were not put to shame. They were not disappointed because you delivered them. They were not mocked. Because you delivered them. You rescued them out of that situation. You met them in their suffering and you delivered, you delivered them in their greatest need. That's what he's saying. And so David is, when he's going through this, one thing I like about this, a lot of times when we feel that like God is not answering our prayer, we get depressed, we get down. But David is recalling all the goodness of God. And we require, when we call the goodness of God, it lifts our spirit. It gives us strength to endure even more, to wait a little bit longer. So this is a, a model prayer, a model song of encouragement. Okay. Verse six, conjunction. But I am a worm and not a man. What is he saying? He says that you 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 did this for them, but I, I'm 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 not them. I'm a worm and not a man. What is, David is saying that the people that look at me, I, I'm just a worm. I'm the lowest thing. I'm meaningless. I'm I'm helpless. I'm not even a man. Uh, that they, they they scorn. I'm scorned by mankind. Okay, I'm despised by the people. All who see me mock me. This is how I'm treated. I'm not even treated with respect. I'm not even treated as a man. I'm treated like a worm, something that's to be squashed and crushed and stepped on and that's worthless, that's meaningless, that has no value, that's weak. He says, I'm scorned, I'm talked about, I'm ridiculed by mankind, I peop I'm despised by people. People hate me, and those who see me mock me. They make fun of me. That says, they make their mouths at me, meaning that, what do they do? They stick their tongue out at me. They move their lips talking about me. They wag their heads. They shake their heads in pity and shame on me like they did. And Jesus, they did the same thing to Jesus. They mocked him, and they shook their heads at him. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads saying, poor soul, poor soul. He deserves, he's who he says he is. If God is who he, he has served the God who he is, then this would not be happening to him. Then they, they look at this. They say this is what they, this is how they mock him. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. If he trusts in God, if his faith is really real, then his God will deliver him. That's what they said about Jesus. 
Let him rescue him for he's delighted. He's a friend of God. If he's really a friend of God. OK, if he really trusts God, God will rescue him. If he's really a friend of God, really trusted him, God will deliver him. They're mocking him. And what they're really saying is that you're, you're must be a hypocrite, because if you're the real deal, God would get you out of that situation. They call him a hypocrite. If your faith was real, God would do something just like Job. Job, if you really were innocent, God would save you. But you're not innocent, and you're the reason why this is happening. Okay. Verse 9. Okay. Now he's going to affirm God. He's going to look back and see what God has done for him. Yet, in spite of this mocking, I know you are he who took me from the womb. From birth, out of my mother's womb, from birth, you took me. You made me part of you. You took me captive. You held me. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. Even before I was born, I was entrusted with your care. Lord, you did this. You protected me from my birth to now. You cared for me. You had your hand of protection over me. You watched over me from the time of my birth to now. You fed me. You nurtured me. On you I was cast from my birth. I was in your custody from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Even in the womb of my mother, you have been my God. From the time I was conceived, you have been my God. He's telling him that, God, you have cared for me from day one, from conception, from in my mother's womb, from the time of my birth. You have been watching over me, watching out for me, having your hand of protection for me. And I'm asking you, do this. Keep that up. God, please answer my prayer. And what we need to understand is that when we're going through what we're going through, Remember the ways God has watched over us. God, I was born into a, a, a bad neighborhood, and yet you ordered my steps. You, I can see how you protected me and did this and this and moved me over here and moved me over there, got me out of harm's way. I can see that I wasn't supposed to make it. I wasn't supposed to live this long, but yet you protected me. You watched over me. God was born with an illness, and yet you delivered me. God was born in unfavorable conditions, and yet you allowed me to prosper. God, you've given me good health when they said I had no good health. You gave me food to eat when I did not have food to eat. You gave me a, a, a financial means, a place to stay when I, should, I had no place to stay. God, you watched over me. You took me from the womb. You protected me. I didn't protect myself. It was you who was protecting me and made me trust you. It was you who made me, put me in your custody, adopted me. On you I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. You have always been my God from day one. That's what we have to remember. God has never abandoned us. If you're a child of God, God has not abandoned you. He has been your God always with you. And we just have to be patient and wait for God to respond to our prayer. He hears our cries. He can't but help heal the cries of his children. He's building our faith. He's strengthening our perseverance, our endurance. He's working something out in our lives. And when the right time happens, he will deliver us. He will rescue us. Then verse 11 concludes with this. Be not far from me. He said, God, don't be far from me. Be close to me. Be not. It, it, God is right by us, but he just feels so far. For trouble is near. He, he's in trouble. Enemies are going to attack him or, or something somebody wants him. And there's none to help. He's pleading out to God. And that's our prayer. He's, 
He's going to the maker of heaven and earth. The one that can do something. The one that's in control of all things. And I pray to you, God, be not far from me. Trouble is there. You know what I'm going through. You know what I'm fighting against. And there is none but you to help. Only you can get me out of this situation. My mama, my daddy, my money, my possessions, my friends, my status, my influence. They can't help me. Only you can help me. There is none to help me. There is none to help me. That's the prayer. That's what, you know, when you get to that point, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. When you says, be not far from me, for trouble is near, there is none to help me. Your, your answered prayer, when you get to that point where you can say that, the answer to your prayer is just around the corner. Just hang on a little bit longer. Just hang on a little bit longer. You're, when you get to that point, you are about where God wants you to be. Your faith is, strong, is stronger. You're not giving up. You're still believing. You're still trusting. Answers right around the corner. Well, I hope something I said today will help you in some kind of way. If you're a teacher in your preparation of your lesson, if you're a student helping you gain better understanding to participate in your Sunday school class. I've enjoyed this lesson. Uh, David's uh, is spoken to all of us. All of us will go through a time in our life where we'll experience this. My God, my God, why art thou forsaken me? And when we go through that, we need to read Psalm 22 in its entirety. Okay? There's much more to this. It's praise and worship. He, he laments over here, but in, uh, beginning in uh, the second half of the psalm, he, he gives praises to God. He ends on a joyful note. When we go through it, David has mapped it out. This will encourage us. Generation after generation, it will encourage us. Okay. God bless you. Uh, we will talk again next week. Uh, may you have a good Sunday and a good Sunday school. Have a good day. Thank you so much.